Hey everyone, this is Abraham. We had some major tech issues with this episode, so the audio gets a little weird in the middle of it. Justin did a great job cleaning it up. Hopefully you will barely notice. I apologize if it's distracting. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. All right, welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I will be your almost hyper host, Abraham. (laughs) And I will be your severely lacking sleep, but perfectly okay with it host, Shane. Awesome. We are a psychology podcast. We like to talk about all things psychology related. And today we get to actually talk about a diagnosis related thing, which is fun because we just recently talked about the big book of diagnosing things in the United States. <laughs> yeah, not not a lot of plot development in that book, but you know, at, at the very least, it was a deep read. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there were some good reviews on Goodreads <laughs> and some not so good reviews. My favorite was that there was a lack of character development and the plot went nowhere. I like that still makes me laugh. Like that is such a silly thing. That was very legit, very legit criticism. Yeah. Anyway, if you like what you're here today, you can support us by simply going to wherever you are listening to this episode and clicking to rate it and then click all the way up to the maximum number of stars that it gives you five, 10, 20, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's only three. Just hit the highest one. I mean, you can hit something lower than that if you don't like it as much, but you know, just hoping for some support here. If you got a little extra time, you can also write a review about what you liked about it. That always helps it out, helps us out, helps others make a decision that they too want to join the bandwagon yeah, yeah. of listening to us. If you'd like to see what we look like, I mean, you can go to our website and there's like pictures of us there. But if you'd like to like watch us in action as mm-hmm. we do this thing, there's a good between five and 20 minutes sometimes of us just sort of chatting about life before we hit record on these episodes. And that too, that can be yours. If you go to yeah. patreon.com and support us, you get a video of us recording, you get notes from our recordings. There's all kinds of stuff available if you want to be at that level. Yeah. But if you don't want to do that, even hitting subscribe, hitting that rating star thing, that'll help us. But yeah, that's all that's all I got for getting started on this one. Do you want to lead us in? Yeah, today we are going to cover hypomania. And that is just to be clear so everybody hears it cuz I know I speak too fast and that's actually a thing. <laughs> Part of being hypomanic. It truly is. And so that's something I learned today. So we are covering hypo mania not hypermania but hypomania and we're going to talk about what that is and, and kind of dive into the diagnosis itself and how it's impactful for people ultimately i decided to pick this topic because you know while we enjoy like fun topics and fun episodes and areas of interest every now and again i like to get a little bit self-exploratory i guess sure. and this is one of those ones where as we go through this i am diagnosed with hypomania And I wanted to understand it a little bit better and maybe provide a little bit of insight for folks who have never heard of it and discuss kind of how it is impactful for people. And so that's what we're covering today. So we are going to cover this diagnosis, how it's impactful. We're going to answer the question of what it looks like, how you can maximize your daily hours and live to your human potential, how to feel good most of the time and all of those things. I had a professor tell me that if I had to have a diagnosis, this is the one to get. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky me, I guess. As you'll see later, it's pretty impactful, but you know, when we talk about it, it's like the least harmful one that people can have, maybe, is what he was trying to get at, but it still has some problems. I have some thoughts. <laughs> I will let those thoughts emerge as we cover the topics related to those specific issues. Yes. But in this episode, we're going to discuss what hypomania is, how it is impactful, and of course, the kind of treatment options that are for us. So this is this is in the the suite of episodes about specific diagnoses. On these episodes we've done where we've looked at diagnoses, we have historically not swung for the like big ones. We seem to always go like underground, low radar, like clinical lycanthropy and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, All the fun stuff. And this is kind of one of those. I mean, this is this is maybe belonging to a cluster of well-known diagnoses, but this itself is, is again, I think, one that fewer people have maybe heard of than if I were to just say, oh, we're talking about depression today. And people would say, hey, I've heard of that one. Yeah, this is one of the ones that people go, excuse me? And then when you see how closely related it is to some of the other diagnoses that we're going to talk about, you'll be like, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. And and I think that is another reason why I wanted to cover it is to show you how nuanced mental health and diagnoses can be. And is this one still in the the DSM-5? Did it make it to that edition? Yes, it did. And we're going to cover the criterion by which somebody might get diagnosed with this. Cool. So. All right. So let's dive into it. So. Again, we are covering hypomania. So H-Y-P-O, 
M-A-N-I-A. And so if you break that apart and look at it, hypo typically means a uh, low, under, beneath, down, or below normal, which is interesting. And that was actually kind of the first thing that you and I talked about at the beginning of this was like, so is it not, are you sure it's not hyper mania, you know? And it was like, no, that's, it's specifically hypo mania, which is weird because the word hypo means below normal. My thought is that they're comparing it to higher levels of mania, but there's not really clear indicator of why they're calling it hypomania. As we talk more about this, you'll you'll hear and you'll see, you won't see, you will hear, you will hear why it sounds like you would think that this would be hypermania because we're talking about manic episodes. Like I hear hypomania and I specifically think subdued, but that's not what we're doing. So it's sort of like, you know, hypoglycemia means low blood sugar. Yeah. But in this case, hypomania meaning manic, but not like really manic. <laughs> so yeah, 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 slightly elevated above normal, I guess. Yeah. Below normal mania. Right. And so the, which brings us to our next term mania, the second part of the word that you started breaking up and I, and I still part two from you <laughs> and people probably recognize this word, but you hear mania and mania is a mental health status that is marked by periods of great excitement or euphoria delusions overactivity, often like lack of sleep, that sort of thing. And we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so then you have essentially mania at a low level. Yeah. So hypomania itself is sometimes described as, quote, an abnormally revved up state of mind that affects your mood, thoughts and behavior. So and that's an end quote right there. But like you can kind of think about this as like, well, so what does it mean when I'm like in the best kind of mood? Does that mean I have hypomania? And that's not what we're really getting at. And we'll get into the diagnostic criteria where we're talking about long periods of time but essentially what this is saying is when somebody's kind of like always revved up and it's not cocaine it might be hypomania <laughs> hypomania over caffeinated you know in that sort of ballpark maybe yeah the diagnosis is often linked to bipolar 2 disorder and cyclothymia mm-hmm. but has also been linked to bipolar 1 disorder and schizoaffective disorder so as i said these are the cluster of diagnoses that are likely much more familiar to people And this is it is associated with those. Yeah, absolutely. So a real quick note, this is not the traditional bipolar disorder that many folks learn about and are afraid of. You hear kind of like people having these major wild mood swings and all that. We're going to probably spend a lot of time digging into bipolar at some point in time to clarify that, because I feel like that is one that's worth kind of demystifying. Sure. And understanding that people can live with that for the rest of their lives and be okay. And hypomania is no different. Hypomania is one of those things where when you're diagnosed with it, you have it forever. If it's properly diagnosed, it doesn't really go away. You know, you, it's just, it's just managed kind of like schizophrenia. Schizophrenia never goes away. It's just managed. Fair enough. And so Shane, yeah, hypomania, I'm letting you know this because you need to know (laughs) (laughs) this is, this is a separate diagnosis found in the DSM five. It has distinct markers and is often characterized as being episodic, usually lasting at least four days. And so essentially meaning that there are these periods of low level mania, I guess, that last for the better part of a week. Yeah. And so within this, too, one thing to look at is that about 60 percent of people diagnosed with bipolar disorder experience episodes of hypomania. So like folks who have bipolar disorder will experience this. Some people will have just hypomania. Some people will be diagnosed with cyclothymia with hypomanic episodes. And that's why it is kind of flies under the radar, because it's very difficult to diagnose because it's hard to figure out onset. It's hard to figure out offset. And most of the time, somebody who has a hypomanic diagnosis is likely diagnosed with something else before they even get to this point. This sounds like the comorbidity issue that they were trying to solve moving from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Mm-hmm. It is. 60% and, and overlap is, is a lot. 60% overlap is a lot. And, and ultimately, what we're going to find is that they didn't really solve the comorbidity issue. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> some of it, but not all of it. Yeah. So, Shane, how do we diagnose this thing? All right. So... Many articles about hypomania often link hypomania and bipolar disorder together, like we just mentioned. Most often you see it linked to bipolar 2 disorder. And to further understand how hypomania works, we're going to take a shallow dive into bipolar disorder briefly. So um, bipolar disorders were previously called manic depression. That's a term that some of the boomers will know. And today we know there are three main types that are described. There's type 1 bipolar disorder, type 2 bipolar disorder, and rapid cycling bipolar, also known as cyclothymia. And these are a type of mood disorder that are commonly classified by rapid changes in mood, behavior, energy levels, and functionality. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and there are specific kind of key indicators for each one. And we're not going to get into that today. But since we're talking about hypomania, we want to talk about bipolar 2 a little bit. So bipolar 2 is more closely related to hypomania, includes symptoms of hypomanic episodes, like those, those episodes where you're kind of feeling elevated and it lasts for a long period of time. But it also includes bad decision-making, lack of impulse control. People tend to be more talkative than usual. They have, this is my favorite characteristic, an average ability to perform at work or at home, <laughs> which is uh, like, you know, when we shared that before with the group, it was kind of like, isn't that just life? Yeah. I think by definition, if it's the average ability, then it's all people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The majority of people, right? Yeah. Feeling creative and productive or feeling more creative or productive in any period of time, being in a good mood for absolutely no reason or signs of depression, including feeling sad for more than two weeks, forgetfulness isolating themselves and suicidal ideation. So these are characteristics that you might find within bipolar two a little bit. Okay. So let's say I walk into this clinic and I'm like, doc, doc spiker. I got, <laughs> I got, I got the hypes. I, I got the hypomania. How are you going to diagnose this? And you're going to look, you're going to look at your, your crack open your trusty DSM five, turn to your favorite chapter and look up the following indicators for whether or not, I merit that diagnosis. And one of the things you're going to look for is a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. So you got the Mel Gibson syndrome. And <laughs> he comes back later. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> abnormally and uh, persistently increased activity or energy. So the, I'm going to call Robin Williams syndrome. Yeah. And lasting at least four consecutive days and present most of the day nearly every day. Yeah. And so that's actually a major thing to look at is like, you know, when you see some other types of mood disorders, you'll find that there's like a rapid swing throughout the day. And with hypomania, it it goes up and it stays up. It's like a consistent, like you'll have like a week where you're like, hell yeah, I can do all this stuff. And then you'll have another week where you're like, I can't do anything, but it's like full on. Like it is like, it does not wane throughout the day, no matter if you have coffee or not. It's really kind of fascinating. Now, real quick to say, if somebody did come to me and said, how would you diagnose me? I would say, sir or madam or whoever you are, I simply cannot. I am not licensed in the state of Florida, and that would be a problem, and I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to refer you to somebody who can. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Different Dr. Spiker then. Different Dr. Spiker. There's probably one out there. There's several, I believe, on Rate My Professor. So <laughs> during the period of mood disturbance, though, you might see an increased energy or activity. Three or more of the following symptoms along with that elevated period might have persisted. Now, if you find that the mood disruption is only irritability, then you're going to want to look for four of these different symptoms, but they represent a noticeable change from usual behavior. It's not just kind of like the day-to-day where you're like irritated that somebody's sending a reply all email and everybody's replying all to the email and all that stuff. Like, you don't, if you're going to email everybody, blind CC everybody or blind copy people, because that's just, you don't want the reply alls, just avoid that. (laughs) But these other ones have to be present to a significant degree. The first one is inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. So if you find somebody who's not normally kind of feeling themselves and for like a week and a half, they're like, yeah, yeah. And they're kind of like that about themselves. That might be one of the symptoms that you look for within this. I personally don't have this. I don't have this. Now, if you are chronically have inflated self-esteem grandiosity, like at no point are you ever not like I am the greatest ever. Is that part of this or does it have to, it has to oscillate? Well, this will oscillate within hypomania. It'll oscillate. Okay. So I was going to say this might be like a Donald Trump just like characteristic, but his is just hyper ego. Yeah. And it stays. And yeah, without ever coming down from, from grandiosity. All right. The other one is decreased need for sleep, meaning that you would feel or the, the, whoever is the person with the diagnosis or maybe being diagnosed with this would feel well rested after only like three hours of sleep, maybe three or four. So a minimum amount of sleep, much less than would generally be recommended. And nevertheless, being like up, ready to go. I imagine there are probably a lot of people who think that they only sleep three hours and actually get more rest than that. And they're like, that's me. But there also might be a lot of people for whom that's true. So I don't know. Absolutely. There's also the folks who are more talkative or they feel a pressure to keep talking. So like they have a hard time with silence in general and just find reasons to talk or we'll talk and talk and talk and talk and talk even if somebody else isn't interested in the conversation. So podcast hosts. Podcast hosts. That's us. (laughs) Flight of ideas or subjective experience that thoughts are racing, which most people at some point, I I would think. but, But yes, that's one of them. 
Another one is distractibility. Like your attention is too easily drawn to unimportant or irrelevant external stimuli. And that's either reported or observed. That can be both of those. So if you cannot focus on listening to uh, a tale of two cities without, you know, from beginning to end without getting distracted, then that's, that might be you. Yep. That might be you. That was, <laughs> that was a really uh, great psychological version of Jeff Foxworthy, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. If you can't listen to tale of two cities and you focus on things that aren't important, you might right. have hypermedia. Yeah. Or ADHD. One of the two things, maybe both. There's also an increase in goal-directed activity. This can be at home, at work, it can even be sexually. And this also can include a psychomotor agitation. So general like need to do a thing, whatever that thing might be. So the episode is associated, the hypomanic episode is, is associated with an unequivocal change in functioning that's uncharacteristic of the person when not symptomatic. So essentially what you're seeing is a change in the uh, productivity. You're seeing the change in the ability to attend a task. You're seeing some change in that person's kind of like day-to-day living that is not normally present. And so what you're, you, these changes occur during these episodes of hypomania rather than kind of like uh, just happening every now and again. It's like, it's not like you just had a bad night's sleep. It's like for an entire week or two, you're going to have a real hard time because of whatever is going on within your, your episode. And it's also not like that this is something that only you experience. Matter of fact, one of the criteria is that this should be observable by people who are around you who can say, yep, they're definitely being a little crazy this week. Don't know what's going on. And sorry to not to use crazy shame anybody, but they're being a little hyper this week, I guess, is maybe the way to put it. They're acting out of the norm. Acting out of the norm. So, you know, the disturbance in the mood or like that kind of functioning are observable by others, like you said. And the mood disturbance is not severe enough to cause a marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or necessitate hospitalization. So what it means is that it's observable, but it's not so bad that you go, oh, there's a real problem. You kind of go. Oh, okay. This is a little bit different to, Oh, like I've heard like, you know, people in my house will be like, Oh, you seem a little bit irritable lately, which is like out of the norm for me. Like I'm not typically irritable or like I'll have weeks where I crank out like a ton of projects and I'm like, boom, 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 get like a bunch of stuff done. And like my whole task list or to-do list is just done. And you're irritable the whole time. And I'm irritable the whole time. I'm like a low grade Hulk, except I don't (laughs) smash anything. I'm just like, kind of like, that's my secret. I'm always just kind of generally irritated. <laughs> That'd be such a funny twist in that line. Like, that's my secret cap. I'm always a little irritated. <laughs> <laughs> and we've talked, we talked about this early too. I think that's just a human condition. I, I, yeah. Being alive is just generally being irritated all the time. I think particularly if you live in like Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I don't think they use the word irritated in Texas, though. I think they use the word ornery. Ornery. Yeah. Ornery. Yeah. 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 Okay. Either way, the episode is not attributable to some kind of physiological effect of a substance, and it's not ever going to be part of really like a psychotic feature, right? There's not going to be anything that is psychotic about that episode or that shift. It's just going to be something that's kind of a little bit out of the norm, noticeable, and pretty persistent overall. Now, note, listener, and you, Shane. A full hypomanic episode that emerges during antidepressant treatment, for example, with medication, but also things like electroconvulsive therapy, which we talked about in like episode two or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a while ago. Yeah. So this this episode, if it persists at a fully syndromal level beyond physiological effects of the treatment, this is sufficient evidence for a hypomanic episode diagnosis. However, Caution is indicated so that one or two symptoms, particularly that increased irritability, edginess, or agitation following the antidepressant use, are not taken as sufficient evidence for diagnosis of a hypomanic episode, or at least not necessarily indicative of a bipolar diathesis. Yeah, so essentially... This is, it goes back to the idea that like these are very hard to pinpoint. Like these episodes and these changes are very difficult to pinpoint as above the average change of a human being. Like, you know, maybe somebody is just having a really good week and that's what it comes down to. Or it might actually be that there is something else going on and it just goes undiagnosed and under the radar because ultimately the changes are fairly mild. They're not these huge swings like you'll see with some other types of mood disorders. And that's why this kind of goes under the radar like it does. Hey, Shane, you, you actually could teach me a new word here. What does diathesis mean? Uh. So diathesis is a tendency to suffer from a particular medical condition. That's what diathesis means. Oh, okay. So kind of like diagnosis. It's just a fancy way of saying like you commonly suffer from this other thing too. 
Got it. Yeah. So in so many words, what does this look like? So we kind of, it, it still sounds pretty nebulous overall, like when you describe it like this. Uh, well, according to verywellmind.com, here are some examples of hypomanic behavior that can indicate that there might be an episode going on. Somebody making crude remarks at a dinner party. So bro, dressing or behaving flamboyantly. Uh-huh. So somebody with poor fashion sense. Okay. A hipster. Yeah. Hipsters mostly like a, somebody with a handlebar mustache probably has a problem. Hypersexuality, including unusual demands of partners or spending a high amount of money in the sex industry. Bro again. Yeah, bro. Jumping from subject to subject while speaking. So podcast host. Mm -hmm. Reduced need for sleep. So somebody who naps. (laughs) That's really good. Reckless spending. So a teenager. (laughs) Yeah. Or Blink-182 in Rock Show. There you go. Taking more chances because you're, quote, feeling lucky. So literally everybody in Las Vegas. (laughs) That's right. Talking rapidly, making it difficult for others to follow an auctioneer. (laughs) Or myself, my students have told me that I talk too fast in my classes. Or high rates of irritability, excitement, hostility, or aggression. So I don't know. Anybody who is standing in line at Starbucks waiting for their cappuccino that didn't come out in time. Oh, that's a good one. I was going to say a Fox News anchor, but I like yours. (laughs) (laughs) That's one of the same, my friend. One of the same. (laughs) Yeah. So this starts to show up in the mid to late teens. So like this is something that doesn't come up very easily early on because you might find these emotional mood swings, these wild mood swings among teenagers just at that time. There's a high emotionality that goes along with being a teenager. Mid to late teens, meaning like 2013, 2014. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now this mixed state is difficult to identify during teen years, right? Because there's like a lot of emotional changes, a lot of hormonal changes, but there's also a lot of like environmental changes. And so it's very difficult to pin down, but due to these commonly cited mood swings and questionable emotional stability, it doesn't get diagnosed till later until there is like some some level of stability in somebody's like hormonal levels after they've gotten out of puberty, after they've kind of moved into adulthood. That's when you start seeing it more. Now, the diagnosis and assessment, there are already existing sort of diagnoses and, ass- and assessments for similar type of disorders. So these are sort of similar to those in nature where the persistent presence of the symptoms and self-report of the concerns may lead to the diagnosis itself. And so there's a lot of Questionnaires. That can actually be a way that this could be potentially diagnosed. And it is difficult, though, because shifts in mood or episodes are often these sort of fluid, dynamic, ongoing things. And it's difficult to identify where it may begin or end so that you can say how long it's been going on. Does it actually meet these criteria? And so it can be difficult to pin pin these down because our experience psychologically is not usually, if ever, one of discrete stopping and end points. It's always sort of a continuous flow state where we're mixing emotions and physiological states and thoughts and all kinds of circumstances and context that are going on. And those overlap and sort of churn. And that's part of the reason it's so difficult to study psychology in the first place, but also the reason it can be really difficult to categorically say whether or not something has or has not occurred. Yeah, absolutely. So then why does this even come up? Why is this a thing that we're even talking about? Well, most often when you come to, when it comes to the difference between hypomanic episodes versus hypomania. Hypomanic episodes are often a symptom of bipolar disorder, and it's those episodes are better explained as, as part of the ongoing symptoms that go along with bipolar disorder. But some other causes like alcohol or drug use can see these temporary shifts or changes. Changes in sleep patterns, depression, high levels of stress, and medication side effects are some of the reasons why you might have hypomanic episodes. But it doesn't quite explain hypomania in general, right? It doesn't explain where it comes from. And and there are some folks that say that it's genetic, like your parents or siblings having it. It could be brain chemistry imbalances. Some people have cited allergies as a reason why you have hypomania, but that doesn't really quite match the, the diagnosis or anything. But for the most part, it is, you have bipolar disorder, but it's a very mild version of it essentially. And that's why they've kind of, because it's so much milder, they've separated it out. It's kind of interesting in there that they they cite sleep, changes in sleep patterns, and although that doesn't say necessarily less sleep, it does sound like in one case that could be the symptom, in another case the cause. And I, I feel yeah. like maybe there is a unclear understanding of cause effect relations here, where what what is treated as an effect of hypomania may in fact may in fact be a contributing variable to how it appears. So, for example, I do wonder if people who are experiencing lack of sleep tend to show behaviors that look hypomanic that are better attributable to behaviors related to their sleeping. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting because it is like, you know, it is very much so like, well, 
am I sleeping poorly because I'm hypomanic or am I hypomanic because I'm sleeping poorly? Like it, it does get into that circular reasoning thing where it's like, it doesn't, it, none of it is causal. Yeah. It is all very like, it's a snake eating its own tail. So like, it's really interesting as you get into that, but. Okay. So I walked into Dr. Shane's office or Dr. Spiker's office. I said, diagnose me. I've got hypomania. And you said, get out, get, <laughs> get. go on, get, <laughs> go on, get. <laughs> Go see a professional. So I went to the other professional down the road, Dr. Spaker, for treatment. And, and Dr. Spaker said, well, okay. Essentially, Dr. Spaker said, do you, do you need this to be treated? I mean, you seem to be super productive. Short term, there aren't a ton of problems going along with this. So maybe it'll be okay. But actually, the, there are there are some things to consider. I'm just making things up for Dr. Spaker here. <laughs> there, there are long-term effects. And that's more or less the reason this could be called a diagnosis, because a lot of this does sound like normal human experience. And we don't want to pathologize normal human experience like average performance at work, for instance. Right. <laughs> But nevertheless, like what where this becomes relevant is some of the long term effects that can come from chronically participating in this without managing it very well, which can of course lead to such things as damaged relationships. If you're untrustworthy and flighty and really difficult to get along with because you are not able to hold a conversation or follow a single train of thought or sleep, there is also the the risk of STIs due to hypersexuality with multiple partners. There can be financial problems related to, as we mentioned, the reckless spending and gambling and that sort of thing, and also a lack of employment due to this other inappropriate behaviors that you might have. Well, on the surface, those all sound like just kind of, again, life experiences, but those are all pretty impactful, right? I mean, sure. STIs, financial problems, poor relationships, lack of employment, they all create hardships that are otherwise not commonly present for many folks who don't engage in more risky behavior. It sounds like we're describing just like college freshmen, but this is meant to be after that (laughs) or maybe before. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Like around, around when you get into college and in much further into the future. Right. So, but another part of this though, is that about 32% of individuals who are diagnosed with hypomania have attempted suicide at least once in their lives with about 20% completing it. So there is a pretty significant suicide rate within this diagnosis that it, kind of goes unspoken or unseen. You know, what ends up happening is because people aren't talking about this diagnosis, a lot of the the statistics that kind of come out are attributed to bipolar disorder, but the specific diagnosis has a pretty significant, you're talking one fifth of people who are diagnosed with hypomania have have completed suicide. You know, it seems related then that on average, someone with bipolar disorder has a shorter lifespan than the general population and is by as much as nine years. And that's, that's a lot. Like that's a very significant chunk of life. Like if you can imagine losing nine years that you would have otherwise had, that's a very impactful, you know, I think generally most people are trying to live as long as they can and be like happy in life. But nine years, man, that's a, that's a chunk of change. Yeah. That's a significant chunk. So Some treatments that are out there, though, like when you kind of talk about this, it can be treatable. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is that this is a chronic condition. It does not go away. Okay, It never, ever, there's no cure for it. It does not leave you. So these treatments that we're going to talk about are long-term treatments that will last somebody for the rest of their life. One is, uh, you know, we talk about psychopharmacological interventions. We talk about antipsychotics. We talk about benzodiazepines, lithium, and valproic acid, which is an anticonvulsant. All of those seem to help with reducing some of the symptoms and help to kind of manage the suicidal ideations and things like that. And then there seems to be more behavioral type treatments, which include things like avoiding stimulants like caffeine, sugar, loud social scenes getting more exercise, getting more sleep, having a regular, consistent, and balanced diet around when and how much and the kinds of things that you eat and that sort of thing as well. And ultimately, like I said, the tr- if, if the treatment is long-term, it's not just one of these things. Typically, it's a combination of lifestyle changes, therapy, and medication together. And all of those things work to impact and kind of improve those mood swings, some of the behavior that might come up as a result of it, and and, in different types of ways that this kind of manifests in that person's life on a day-to-day basis. All right, let's talk about some of the research that has been done around hypomania. First, we have an article from Meyer et al. in 2014, and this was using the hypomania checklist, or the HCL32, because catchy titles, you know. And in their study, they used this to help identify properties of bipolar disorder. It was noted that this can be helpful in screening, but should not be used alone. 
and the diagnosis. And side note on this, the HCL32, which sounds like it should be a virus, is a checklist, not a virus. And it's similar to what you'll find in other psychological practice, as we mentioned when we were talking about the tools used for diagnosing such things, um, where this is a self-assessment checklist. Patients will more or less say, yep, that's me, or nope, that's not me. There are currently talks to reduce the checklist to only 16 items. Lengthy checklists can lead to, well, there's, there's all kinds of issues but with the length of a checklist. Too short, too long, you got to find the right balance in there. So that's where, where research is currently at. Yeah. There's also Soups, Mints, and McElroy, which sounds like uh, a really interesting restaurant. I was thinking like an indie folk rock band, maybe even one from like the, the 80s that no one, that never really got off the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they would have played at CBGV's like uh, television and like Blondie, but never, never got the record deal. Yeah, they were never a headliner on tour, always a supporting act. Soups, Mints, and McElroy. <laughs> Soups, Mints, and McElroy. So they conducted, this was in 2005, they conducted a lengthy study that included 908 patients over a seven-year period. There was something like 15,000 sessions they had, like therapeutic sessions in that time frame. And the findings indicated that patients with bipolar 1 were more likely to experience hypomania or hypomanic episodes. So they were more likely to have those symptoms, but because they had bipolar one, the, the symptoms were better explained by bipolar one than it was by hypomania. They also found that depression and symptoms of depression were more significant in female patients compared to male patients, suggesting that the symptoms might appear differently across sex demographics. So this is another thing that might contribute to why this is getting underdiagnosed is because it might present differently across different types of patients. Ah, interesting. Yeah. From Carr in 2017, in this article, the author argued that animal models can be used to help develop further behavioral treatment for human patients with bipolar disorder. And of course, need to note that this model may be a challenge given that the disorder does not general does not necessarily generalize well to other species. You know, I think we're making a big inferential leap when we assume that we can detect what looks like a human mental health condition in other animals, even with like using an analog. An interesting point in this article, however, it is noted that applied behavior analysis and other third wave behavioral treatments have been effectively demonstrated to decrease relapse rates and rehospitalization for those with this diagnosis, which is really interesting. So essentially, there is good evidence, empirical support for the use of applied behavior analysis and interventions derived from that field to help treat the symptoms of, uh, of bipolar. That was a nice little surprise when I was reading that. I was like, huh. That's cool. Who knew? I was not expecting that when I was reading it. I was like, that's that's neat. I like that. Pat yourselves on the back. You done it. That's what I said out loud. <laughs> I, I can imagine this, too. I can imagine just sitting behind you in your office, creepily watching you do your research. And you're like, huh, that's neat. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I do. I'm like, huh, OK, all right. That's neat. Some other tidbits that we thought were interesting about this, and we spent a lot of time talking about bipolar, but it, it is so closely related that it is worth that's that's it's like it's so like enmeshed with this that it is worth talking about. But individuals diagnosed with bipolar 2 are highly likely to have hypomania as well, with 75% of people diagnosed with bipolar 2 having a combination of hypomanic episodes and anxiety. So but I'm gonna just jump ahead to take on points real quick and say today I learned I have bipolar two, apparently. <laughs> 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 that's what i learned in all this research no but like and, and i've obviously that's one of those things where it's like when you start studying something you're like oh i definitely have that oh yes professional don't don't do that but like as i'm going through i'm like oh shit okay i should probably ask about this at least that is a good point i'm glad you mentioned that because i definitely felt like as we were reading through the items the criteria the examples the symptoms i was like hey that's me hey that's me but that's that's honestly that is a concern for whenever you talk about a diagnosis and you start getting into the descriptions of a diagnosis it's like a horoscope man like and that's this one in particular really reads like a horoscope it's like hey if you do stuff and sometimes you do that stuff a lot and sometimes you don't do it so much and sometimes you're good at it and sometimes you're not you might have this disorder i'm like well it, that's called being a human being disorder. And I def I definitely have that one. I don't know. It's it's one thing just I think as you mentioned to point out, if you feel like this is you, go ahead and go get that, you know, go see a doctor and ch check and see this might be you. And also just acknowledge that like like a horoscope, it's really easy to have a lot of hits on something that is extremely general and describes what is literally in the definition as average human behavior. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. A factor on that. Yeah. Another interesting tidbit here. Princess Leia 
also known by her alias Carrie Fisher, famously struggled with bipolar disorder and highlights her struggles in her book called Postcards from the Edge. So R.I.P. Carrie Fisher. Yeah. And I accurately but unknowingly called that Mel Gibson also has bipolar disorder. This does not excuse his anti-Semitism, but it does explain some of his behavior, maybe. Yeah, a little bit. It doesn't explain his behavior. It describes his behavior. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to stop doing that. He's got to yeah. stop doing stuff like that. I agree. I'll add to the take home points on here that what's interesting about this one is, again, it, it has a lot of overlap with the with bipolar one, bipolar two. And what I what I think is interesting about this is it does sound like it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, those long term effects are ones to definitely keep your eye on. But I also just kind of wonder, you know, if it's not pathological, then to me, it's not necessarily something to be particularly concerned about, at least for myself. And one of the reasons to call something a disorder is all is because it interrupts your general functioning. And in the long term, this does. So I think, again, if it is something to di- that you have and get it diagnosed, then that's fair, then that will help manage those treatments. But it also sounds like what's really difficult to determine here is the cause and effect. Like, are you doing these things and therefore you are like you're doing certain things that result in you behaving in this this pattern because there are these all these behavioral treatments. And so if this is a shift in behavior, well, then we know what to do about that. And there are medications you can use, but it just occurs to me that this is something where I think one should be careful to pathologize human experience. And Mm -hmm. and in this case, obviously, experts have weighed in. I'm, I'm not one of those people who's done a lot of research on this. So I'll let them, you know, I'm not going to try and, and undermine what they've done, but uh, it is, it does strike me as one that there's a risk of pathologizing normal human experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think my last take home point on this is for me, and, and this is just more of an anecdotal thing as I've lived with this for years and I have learned to manage and identify when I'm kind of entering an episode and when I'm leaving an episode like that. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of being able to do self-reflection and recognizing your own patterns of behavior. And I'm sure that I'm not perfect at it, but I can be, I know when I'm like, oh, I'm elevated and I'm getting stuff done. Like I have like permanent products that can do that. And, you know, I think it's still worth though, understanding that this is something that I will live with forever. And as I start to see it have impacts, that's when I need to maybe reach out for help and stuff like that. I have not seen that yet, but I am seeing, I do see like every now and again where things get a little bit on shaky ground and it's like, Oh, I got to like, kind of like reel that back in. And it, it's, it's not easy. And this is something that's a fairly manageable diagnosis compared to some that have more severe swings. And it's still very difficult to keep a grip on. So definitely the idea of like going to therapy, getting help, I don't take medication for it, but definitely going to therapy and doing the behavioral interventions are super, super helpful for it, at least for me. Awesome. I think that's great. And I'll say my last take on point is I think you're swell. Oh, I think you're swell. <laughs> <laughs> that's my last take point, but is I think you're swell too. <laughs> so I have a piece of listener mail for us. Yay. So this one came from Natalie. This is actually something that was posted to our Facebook. And um, she noted that in an episode we'd recorded recently, we sort of made a joke about how we put people to sleep. And although it came across, I think, as a little self-deprecating, we actually, I'm, I'm perfectly cool with that. Like, if I help people sleep, I'm really great to hear about that. And she actually wrote to us to let us know that she uses why we do what we do for the purpose of sleeping on a regular basis. And she said specifically, not in the you're so boring, you put me to sleep sort of way. But we have those, you know, I think we 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 carry the cadence of facilitating sleep, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. <laughs> um, without, I think, uh, revealing too much about Natalie, she, she mentioned having a panic disorder and that falling asleep is an extremely likely situation in which she was going to experience panic. And so it, just sort of that line in bed, trying to go to sleep and your mind just racing about other things that you're thinking about. And so listening to audiobooks and podcasts, she says, I accidentally realized that I don't panic if I'm listening to speeches, I'm falling asleep like ever, which is awesome. 
and mentioned specifically that uh, she regularly listens to to our podcast and other podcasts as well as audiobooks to help her sleep, but not again because we're boring and that she will eventually re-listen to the episode to hear the parts that she was asleep through. And there is, for the most of you who listen to podcasts, if you don't know this, there is a sleep setting you can put on that says like, you know, uh, this I'm listening to, listening to this to go to sleep, turn this off after like 20 or 30 minutes or something like that. And so you just set a sleep timer and then it won't it won't burn through your whole playlist that you've got queued up. And so she says, I can sleep through human speech, most podcast theme songs, but for some reason the recommendations was so we just woke her up <laughs> or about to wake her up. What should be the alarm clock? So so she says, anyway, now you know that you help a total stranger sleep most Wednesday nights. So um, thank you so much for writing, Natalie. That was really sweet. I'm more than happy to help pe- put people to sleep, hopefully not while they're driving, but at any other time they're lying in bed and they want to listen to the, <laughs> the the scratchy, shrill voices of, of two white guys. We're, we're ha- happy to be able to provide that. No, it's it's great. I mean, and and you, and when you say put people to sleep, you don't mean euthanasia. You mean like actually get rest. <laughs> I, I'm I am confident that both she and I meant <laughs> yes, restful, temporary sleep. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Thanks for for clarifying that, though. No worries. You know, there's all there's always someone out there. It's like, wait a second. Lovely. All right, let's do some recommendations. Let's do it. Recommendations. All right. So my recommendation, we are getting into spooky season. And so I am reading spooky books and watching spooky movies. And so I am going to go with the recommendation of The Mist by Stephen King. Oh, nice. What a story. Let me tell you. So if you pick up the book, the book is very short. It's like 160 pages or something. It's a novella, really. Or I'm sorry, it's like 170 pages. So it's it's a nice, easy read. It's very straightforward. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. The movie is a really good adaptation of it. Nice. It's actually pretty spot on. And as a matter of fact, Thomas Jane, really good as the main character. Stephen King has come out and said that the ending of the Mist movie was actually better than his own and prefers it. So if that says anything about kind of how good the movie was, it's one of the better adaptations and it's definitely worth a watch. So whether you get the book or you get the movie, I recommend doing both. You can do them both in a weekend and that will be wonderful. And you can compare and contrast. And I think that you would appreciate both of them for their different storytelling. Stephen King notoriously does not like writing endings. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a thing. Yeah. So he he likes writing just the story and then eventually stops, which is fine. Yeah. And that's actually, you know, and that's one thing that's like really interesting about this one is like, it does just kind of stop in the, in the book. And Arguably, the horrors that are in the mist are not even really the horrors that people need to worry about. It's the horrors of humanity. And he does a really good job. Like, if you really want to talk about a psychological writer, this guy understands like the human psyche, like the horrors of human psyche better than any writer I've ever seen. In the end, the monsters were ourselves. (laughs) That's that is a summary of all like 180 of his books. (laughs) Prolific. All right, I'm going to, this is a weird thing to recommend, but I'm gonna, because I'm excited and I want other people to be excited. And that is a trailer for an upcoming TV series called The Wheel of Time, based on my favorite fantasy series. And so there's a, there's a, Amazon bought the rights to turn this into a TV show. They've finished the, what the first season, which is going to come out in November of 2021. They've already been greenlit for a second season. And then I'm hoping that they will continue to be able to make seasons that progress through the entire series. Now, the series is 14 books long, but I believe they're planning on doing this in seven or eight seasons. So they'll be obviously cutting some things, which for those who have read the books know that there are things that can be cut. And that's that's okay. There's some like thousand named characters or something in the book that they don't necessarily need to all be there. But I'm just absolutely thrilled I am extremely excited. I have not looked forward to any any movie or TV show nearly as much as I'm looking forward to this ever. And I think that even includes like Infinity War. And so I am I'm really hoping that people go watch this TV show when it comes out. And so I'm recommending the trailer. I posted a link to that. And you can find that on YouTube or Amazon's page. But um, anyway, that's my recommendation. So when you told me that that was out, I did watch it. It looks fantastic. Like it yeah. looks really, really great. Yeah, they did a good job, I think, with that trailer, really trying to reach a general audience and not like super specific fan servicey things, which is a good idea. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Anything else on Hypomania? Nope, not today. Lovely. All right. If you would like to tell us about how we help you sleep, if you would like to recommend a book or movie, 
or TV show or uh, tell us about your hypomania or your experiences with bipolar, we would really enjoy hearing from you and be more than happy to share your message. You can reach us on all the social media platforms. You can also email us directly at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. And as I mentioned, leave a rating and a review, subscribe, all those sorts of things. Before I go, I would like to thank the people who really helped make this possible, which is our Patreon supporters, our loyal and generous Patreon supporters, Amanda, Justine, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, and Shauna. Thank you all for your support. Of course, I'd like to thank you, Shane, for your notes and for recording with me today. Thank you, thank you everyone, me. for listening and joining us on this episode. And of course, thank you to our team. Justin Greenhouse is our audio producer and sound mixing engineer wizard. Amber does social media. And Selena, Kyle, and Alan do a lot of things, but a lot of writing and, uh, and behind-the-scenes work, particularly on our website and some organizational sort of stuff. So thanks to them for making this happen as well. And so I think that is all I have. This is Abraham. Hey, this is Shane. We are out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. Why We Do What We Do is supported in part by our amazing patrons. Thank you. If you like what you heard, consider becoming a patron by heading to patreon.com slash podcast. You can also rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts or share this episode with your friends. If you have any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Find us at podcast on your favorite social media platforms. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. There, you'll find links as well as detailed and shareable show notes. Why We Do What We Do is researched and produced by Abraham, Ryan O, Shane, and Miranda. Artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com. Video and production assistance from Tyler Brassier with music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. You know, what's, what's happened here is that sometimes technology does not work the way that we expect it to. And so Zoom crashed. It crashed on all of us. And uh, it is preventing you and me and everybody else on God's green earth from watching Abraham talk about this in his beanie. We're not thrilled with that.